Hi, this is Michael Shreve, and you're listening to Drummer Talk. Hey, what is up? What is up? It is Thursday, April 4th, 2013, and welcome to another episode of Drummer Talk, the Internet's longest-running drumming podcast. Coming straight at you from the happiest place on Earth, Orlando, Florida, and it is so good to be back with you in your podcast ears. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Drummer Talk. Florida is great. It's as you guys know, we we've moved to Florida. Me and Mrs. What is up? We've moved to Florida uh, last summer, and we came in at the end of well, not end. I, I guess I'd say the middle of summer last year. And there, we, we, check out show number one hundred and seventy-five or seventy-four, where we talk all about the move. But uh, summertime it, it was already in, in full swing when we started when we moved down here last summer. It was in full swing, and it was hot, and uh, people were, were kept telling us about how hot it was and how humid it was, and, and I, w- I would tell them it's nothing at all like Memphis hot. And uh, it, you know, Because in Florida, it doesn't get triple digits for two weeks straight like it did in Memphis. And so uh, in Florida, it never got that hot. It, it was hot. The, the sun is a different kind of hot, and this is what you tuned in. This is weather talk. With uh, with your host Dave Croft, Dave Croft's weather talk. But it was never really crazy like Memphis hot. So now here it is. We lived through the 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 winter, and the winter was so mild the whole time. And uh, I kept just kept blowing my mind what it was like. Because it was exactly like people said it was. I now know why people come down here. The, the snowbirds, they call them. They would come down here to escape, you know, northern winters and everything. And and absolutely, it's all true. It's true what they say about Florida winters. They're so mild. Uh, we we would eat outside on the, the back patio all the time. It was great and wonderful. But since we came in the summer, we really didn't experience what spring was like. And I'm telling you, it seemed like once the first day of spring hit, Florida changed. It changed from this kind of dry, mild winter thing to this wet, rainy season. You know that, that scene in Castaway where uh, where Tom Hanks' character is on the island? You know, he's emaciated and skinny and and... One day, the winds change. It's like all of a sudden, all the leaves start blowing the opposite direction. And I was not expecting it, but it is kind of exactly like that here in Florida. Because it was like the first day of spring, bam, we get rain, we get weather. And it's been a whole different experience. The sun feels different. It's weird. It's very weird. And, And what I did not expect is... I have completely lost touch with what the weather's like in other areas. Like I'm in, I lived in Memphis for 11 years, and I I can't remember. Hey, and you know, in the the beginning of April, was it cold? I, I don't remember. But luckily, we have Facebook, so I am uh, well well versed in uh, what's happening uh, back in Memphis, and uh, I definitely can keep up with all my friends. Speaking of keeping up. Sure would like for you to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash drummer talk, or you can follow us on Twitter at drummer talk. That is the Twitter handle for you. We would absolutely appreciate it. Let's do a, uh, let's do a follower update. Last week we announced that we, we crossed 4,000 Twitter followers, which is staggering to me. This week we have 4,113 so from last week, we've gained 113 Twitter followers since last week, and I'm, I'm blown away and humbled by all the people that follow us on Twitter. You should follow us on Twitter. Why? Why should you follow us on Twitter? Well, all of the stories that get posted up to drummertalk.org get also posted up to Twitter for direct links to the stories that we cover here on Drummer Talk. 
Additionally, uh, we post out the link for the live feed. That goes uh, directly out as well, so that whenever we go live, that drummer, that link hits. So that's awesome. Um, the link came out a little bit late today. I posted it, and then it didn't go up, and I had to, you know, I was wondering, hey, why, why is anybody plugging in yet? But I did have to go and check it and pushed it out. So it's a little bit later. We do have a couple of viewers. Thank you very much for tuning into the live feed. You might notice that the live feed thing is a little bit different. Instead of like putting on, you know, just so you see my face talk there, we actually get a better audio rate over the, the Google Hangouts. We get a better compression rate if we don't have moving picture. So we just have kind of a, a placeholder, Drummer Talk 177. Today's topic do-it-yourself distribution. That's what we're going to be talking about today. But we have a, a, a special, it's just a little Drummer Talk logo thing that I put together. Uh, hopefully to give better audio quality to the live feed that you can check out. And you can even participate. There's like a little chat window and everything that, uh, that you can, if you want, to chat along with us into the group chat. You can absolutely do that through the live feed, and I will be uh, keeping my eye out on that for you to participate for some live feed. This, we, the live thing is just something we push out there. It's, it's, as you know, if you've been listening to Drummer Talk for any length of time, we've, we've dabbled in live feeds, and we've dabbled in wanting to kind of create this interactive live experience. But, you know, with podcasting and with, with radio, you know, and, unless you're doing it like morning drive time or, or prime work hours – then the chances of, of someone being able to sit near their computer at 7:30 on a Thursday night, you know, it's it's not exactly it's not exactly like the old days of crowding around a radio or something like that. But we do have we do have some people that uh, join us, and so really excited. We I like to throw out the live feed just so you guys can listen to what we're doing live, and also um, that. That live feed gets pushed uh, out to YouTube as well. So we, we want to give you, the listener, multiple ways that you can experience Drummer Talk. Obviously, we have uh, the podcast through iTunes that you can download. That would be great to have that. Every week, every Thursday night, the new episode drops. And hopefully Friday morning, you can take it to work with you and, 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 have, and enjoy Drummer Talk on your Friday drive in or Friday at work or whatever. Also at the at the website, you can click on the episode for today. This is episode 177. And you can it'll always be the latest drummer talk episode will always be the furthest to the left on the pin board. Last week it was a uh, drummer talk 176 spotlight on Mike Johnston and I've gotten an overwhelming response from um, people that really enjoyed the Mike Johnston interview and mad Thanks and mad propers to Sir Mike Johnston for sitting down, giving giving us a lot of time. Really appreciate that, Mike. Also retweeted it. I'm sure, we got some uh, followers from Mike Johnston. So if you are listening to Drummer Talk because uh, you heard about us through Mike's website, thank you very much. Mike's Lessons.com. That was last week. Good ep good episode last week. If I do say. <laughs> We really enjoy it. But what's what's it like going on in your world? Do you have any gigs going on right now? Do you have anything that uh, that's that's happening in your drumming world? Or maybe maybe drumming is a hobby for you? Then you're at the right place. If you're a student, if you're a percussion student, if you're in college, then you are at the right place. Drummer Talk is just for you. If you if you're retired, maybe you're just interested in drums, or maybe you just like talking to drummers or about drum stuff, then this podcast is for you. So thank you very much. The format of the show, I realize, you know, I, ass I just assume that everybody kind of knows the flow of drummer talk, but, but we always start off just with some banter or some, we have guests and everything. But then I do some news items. I like to highlight some things from the pin board that have come up over the last week. And then we have our topic and that's it. Speaking of topic, today's topic is DIY distribution, do-it-yourself distribution. As it turns out, a lot has changed over the last 10 years as far as how to get your music to 
your fans or your music to the public. It used to be that the record labels kind of controlled all of that, and then one single event occurred. Well, I should say one single company came along and drastically changed the game. And the record companies were left kind of behind the times, but one company came along and with that ushered in a whole new era of do-it-yourself independent distribution where the record company no longer held the bulk of the power. I, I, let me, let me, I'll back off of that a little bit because they do hold a lot of a bulk of the power in the music industry. So I, I'm not hating on record. And this is not going to be a uh, hate the record label episode. No, but th what today we're going to be talking about is, is how do we empower you? Let's say you're in a band and you guys have cut a demo and you want to get it out there. In the past, you'd have to really rely on a record label discovering you and then doing that for you. Getting you into the stores. But thanks to one company. Who, what company is it? Maybe you already know. <laughs> I'm going to say that. I'm teasing for a little bit later. So that is our topic. Topic number 177. DIY distribution. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and talk about what has happened. What has been new and popular on the pin board. Really, a lot, a lot of stuff has happened over uh, the last week. Of course, you know, we love contests. And so the Hit Like a Girl contest has announced its 40 finalists. There are 20 from the under 18 and 20 from the 18 and over category. So that is the Hit Like a Girl contest at, uh, I believe it's hitlikeagirl.com. So proud of our own Jessica Frizzell, Jay Frizz. She has been on the show before. She was a former student of mine, and uh, she did pretty good. I think she got, uh, she's in the 18 and over category, and I think she was in the top 50, maybe even top 40. Sadly, she did not place high enough, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of a popularity contest. It's all about, you know, how many votes you get and, you know, whatever your, your, uh, your, your breadth of, influence is that having been said I'm not I'm not discounting the people that placed because I listen to a lot of these videos and many of them many of them are absolutely worthy of being up there some of them maybe not not so much I mean there are some clear front runners uh, I don't, I don't want to I don't want to I'm not gonna I'm not, all biased for Jay Frizz because she's one of my own she's my girl Jay Frizz if you are listening Shout out and Mad Proppers. She's a drummer for the indie Christian band Ilya. I don't know. Are you still indie, Jay Frizz? We need to have you on the show. I would love to have you on the show. Why don't you give me a call? Give me a ring. But that is the Hit Like a Girl contest. And they are... They're, it's, it's, I, I don't know... I don't know how to, how, to, how to feel about the contest. If I'm being honest. On one hand, it's super empowering, and I think it it raises awareness of female drummers and how the f how females are, are really underrepresented in the percussion industry, uh, and through nothing more than stigma. I don't know. Is it stigma? Is being a girl drummer is there is is there a, a certain type of girl who's a drummer? I don't know. Maybe. Does the opposite hold true? Is there a certain type of guy who is a clarinet player? I mean, you got Benny Goodman. He was a clarinet player. But I think historically you would see, you know, if I think back to high school band or whatever, it's kind of like all the dudes were the brass and all the girls were the woodwinds. That seemed how it to be, except for sax, which sax had kind of a mix. But I, I don't know. I don't know about the stigma. And so... When I say I'm mixed about the contest, it's not like I'm, I'm hating on it or whatever. Just a, a contest very specifically targeted to one demographic, be it gender or 
ethnicity or whatever, always, always kind of, I don't know, I don't know. What do you think? It always kind of trips me up a little bit. That having been said, I, I am glad that they are raising awareness. And, and hopefully, if there are girls out there who feel weird about being a drummer because maybe there's a, a, a stigma on it, you know, whether it's a tomboy or, or, or whatever. But I got to tell you, some of the hardest hitting drummers I've ever, ever seen, Jen Ledger from Skillet, who is a beast on the drums. Some of the hardest hitting drummers I've ever seen have been drummers. I taught a, a female drummer back when I lived in North Carolina. And she was really timid with her hands, right? So, like, I couldn't get her to play the snare drum loud enough. I couldn't. I'd beg her and beg her. I'm like, come on. Hit it, hit it. But her foot, she shook the pictures off the wall in the room because her foot was so heavy. So so it's it's not a strength thing. Maybe, maybe it's just drums. Maybe it's, you know, what is it? Uh, puppy dog tails and pigs and pig. What is it? What is it? <laughs> puppy dog tails. That's what boys are made of. And girls are made of softer stuff, I guess. But maybe maybe it's just the mentality of being a drummer. I don't know. I would love to know what you think. So give me a shout out over at drummertalk.org. A couple of cool events coming up that I want to I want to share with you. First of all, is the Big Drum Bonanza, which is an annual drum camp hosted by world-class drummer and our very own Thomas Lang. And what it is, it's a five-day hands-on drum camp with, like, guest teachers. Here are the guest teachers, which are, you know, scheduled to include Chris Coleman, who plays with Prince, George Duke, Shaka Khan, NKOTB. That's new kids on the block. Stanton Moore, Galactic, Virgil Donati, Planet X, Alan's Hold, Alan Holdsworth, Steve Vai, John Deddy, who we've talked about recently, he sat in for Slayer, Anthrax, at the uh, the Australian tour, where all these drummers kept kept dropping out from Travis Barker and Dave Lombardo gets fired from Slayer, and of course Thomas Lang will be at this thing, this big drum bonanza, and it's hosted. In Oxnard, California, California, and it's it's set. Um, it's kind of backed by Thomas Lang, obviously. It's going to be hosted at the Courtyard Marriott Hotel, where they'll you know conference rooms and stuff. And it's really um, put on by the folks at Drum Channel, which is also DW. June twenty fifth through 29th, two thousand and twelve. Now there are some different packages that you can look at. There's the five-day ca uh, camp only, which is $1,500. And then there's the five-day camp plus the hotel, which is right there in the Courtyard Marriott, which is $2,200. Meals are not included. You do get free breakfast if you're at the hotel, though. It's a continental. Single occupancy, five nights, free Wi-Fi, health club. You know, everything you come to expect from a courtyard. The free Wi-Fi. Now, if it was a more expensive hotel, they'd charge you extra for Wi-Fi. I don't understand that, but that's a rant for later. Why the the nicer hotels charge you for Wi-Fi. It's like, hey, you have so much money. We're going to go ahead and charge you extra. It's an amenity they should throw in, but anyway. Now, if you want to go and just casually observe some of the camp activities, there's no charge for that. But the instructors might, you know, they might kick you out if it's too many. There's also going to be a Drum Channel DW Factory Tour, which is cool. You get to tour the studios in Oxnard. So this is a drum camp with workshops, seminar, guest instructors. So you should check it out. Fifteen hundred bucks, twenty-two hundred bucks. That's it's it's a little it's a little steep, but when you consider what it is, and it's 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 a, a camp 
with instructors, these interactive lessons. It's kind of like a drumming boot camp. Private lessons with the featured guest teachers, 2200 bucks to study with Stanton Moore, Virgil Donati, Thomas Lane, Chris Coleman. The cool thing about this camp is there's, there's a broad range of styles. You have guys that have played with Prince and Shaka Khan and Galactic, Mars Volta, Slayer. So kind of whatever you're into, they, they, have, they have something for you. Now, if you want to find out more, you go to BigDrumBonanza.com. A lot of information out there. You can check that out. And if, if someone goes, man, I would love to hear back from you. I would love to hear how it went and what you thought. How did it go? Hey, there's a video here. Let's, let's see what this video does. All right, so this is uh, that's the twenty that's the two thousand twelve dates. So that was from last year, but the two thousand thirteen dates. Let me make sure that I give you. It's July third through seventh. I'm very sorry, sorry about that. And uh, it looks like that this is uh, this is hosted uh, there at the Drum Channel Studios. So as opposed to the um, not hosted right there at the courtyard. So it looks like it's going to be the Drum Channel Studio. So sorry about that. But the Chris Coleman, Stanton Moore, all that stuff is uh, is still still the same that you can expect to check out. So check that out, and if you go, if, if we have some people going, man, I would, I would absolutely love to hear how it goes. Please send us back a report. The next thing I want to talk about is last November. This is when uh, Drummer Talk was on its hiatus. Uh, we lost an amazing drummer in the gospel community, Marvin McQuitty. And money is being raised for a documentary chronicling Marvin McQuitty Jr. Check it out. Hi, my name is Richie Allen. I'm a director and I'm used to being behind the camera, but I'm stepping out in front of the camera to tell you a little bit about the upcoming documentary on the godfather of gospel drumming, Marvin McQuitty Jr. We got Marvin McQuitty. Marvin McQuitty is probably the most recognized gospel drummer um, in the world right now. Marvin's wife, Kim, approached me a few months ago about getting a team together to chronicle Marvin's life and to give everyone a chance to see not just the legend, but the man. My dad was an amazing musician, but an even greater father, husband, friend, and mentor. His life left an impact on so many people around the world, and we want to make sure that his legacy is continued. This film will be a full-length documentary about Marvin's music and his relationships, his faith, his family, and his failing health due to the rare autoimmune disease myelofibrosis that eventually ended his life. Thank you. The purpose of the documentary is not only to share the story about Marvin, the musician, the man, but it's also to create an opportunity to provide resources for the Marvin McQuitty Foundation. Marvin could often be heard saying, put yourself in a position to help, your, to help someone else. 
that's the reason why we created this foundation so we can continue his legacy of mentorship, musicianship, and giving. The purpose of the Marvin McQuitty Foundation is to provide resources to underprivileged youth, music students, and those musicians who aspire to hone their craft, to learn more about their craft, and don't have the opportunity to do so. Many individuals plant a tree and honor their loved one. We decided to start an, an organization, a foundation that we can sow into the next generation to help those that are coming behind. This documentary brings together some of the biggest names in, in the music industry. Bill Maxwell, Alex Acuna, Sheila E., Fred Hammond, Israel Houghton, Mary Mary, Will Kennedy, Mario Winans, and Dennis Chambers, just to name a few. We're asking for your help to raise $10,000 for the production of the documentary. We have 30 days to raise the funds, so any contribution you make, large or small, is greatly appreciated. This is not just to celebrate the life of my dad, but to teach others the importance of being more than just the music. And so this is over at Indiegogo.com, and we'll have a link to this in our show notes that you can absolutely check out. Now, they need to raise $10,000 in 30 days, and right now they're at $2,311, and they only have 19 days left. Now, they didn't approach me. This isn't me, you know, getting something. They're, they're, I'm, I'm not, you know, pimping this out, you know, for some... No, this is an awesome opportunity for you, the listener, to give back to have this, this film being made. And we also heard in that video, we heard from his, his kids, very young, beautiful children, who are going to grow up without their father, which is staggering to me. This is the concept. 19 days left. They have until April 23rd by 11.59 p.m. Please consider making a contribution. Not for me. Not for, you know, some sort of sense of duty. But because I believe this is a, this is a film that needs to get made. Now with other, you know, with, with all Kickstarter type campaigns, there are, are things, there are some perks for your contribution. At $25, you get a poster, a copy of Kim McQuitty's book. At $50, you get that plus a digital download of the documentary. For $100, you get all of that, the, 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 the poster, the book, the, the digital download plus a CD for $500, all of that, plus you get associate producer credit and reserve seating at the premiere screening. And for $1,000, you get all of those things plus executive producer credit and VIP seating at the premiere screening. One of those have already been claimed. So consider donating. And I know you Drummer Talk listeners are some of the most generous, kind, community-driven people I've ever had the pleasure of interacting with. So we'll have a link to that in our show notes that you can check out. If this episode isn't at the front of the page, just do a search for 177, 177, and you'll be able to pull this up. Again, that closes down by April 23rd. And, and we'll, we'll mention it again in the future. We'll mention the, uh, the Marvin McQuitty Foundation or the Marvin uh, McQuitty documentary. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. A couple of uh, quick news items. Ex Mars Volta, or ex the Mars Volta drummer John Theodore to join Queens of the Stone Age for their new record. That's exciting. New record's called Clock uh, Like Clockwork. And according to a press release, the tracks have already been Recorded. This is the uh, sixth studio album from Queens of the Stone Age. As far as when it's going to be released, I'm not exactly sure. Not exactly sure when it's going to be released. But check it out. There's also other drummers on that record. Dave Grohl and Joey Castillo. 
And of course, John Theodore. Joey Castillo was the drummer of Queens of the Stone Age, now John Theodore, who played drums for the Mars Volta on their first three records, as well as did tours for him. So that's cool. A few weeks ago, we recorded that Kelly Pickler's drummer, Greg Lohman, was in a vicious wreck. And as it turns out, he's doing much better. He is on the mend. Very happy to hear about that. According to Nashville Fox affiliate WZTV, he's been released into the care of a Louisville area rehab facility. Is walking and eating on his own. So that is awesome news. In gear nudes, news, it looks like Ludwig is getting into the small, intimate, portable drum market. And they're teaming up with none other than the reigning king of funk drumming, Questlove. Check it out. This kit right here is called the Breakbeats by Questlove. And one of the main things that I hear from New York area musicians is that, uh, you know, they're not able to fit their instruments inside of their apartments. You know, New York is not a town that you drive a lot in. Um, it has small compact space. So I kind of wanted to build a device that was apartment friendly and, you know, very uh, compact of many so that if you're a street musician, you can play on the streets. Um, if you're playing in the club, if you're playing in Queens somewhere and you got to get on the subway, all the stuff can easily fit. Uh, in your hands, and you can go to your gig. So I wanted something that was uh, quality sounding as far as what I call breakable, uh, as far as it being gritty and raw, and I wanted it also to um, be compact. 7 by 10 is the uh, size of our uh, miniature Tom up here. Uh, 13, 13 is the size of the floor Tom, and 14, 16 is the size of the kick pedal. I wanted to keep a traditional uh, snare sound because I like the fullness of, of our snare drums. So uh, for me, I, I prefer 14 inch snares. The Breakbeats uh, initial line is Azure Blue. Um, I wanted a sort of a, a flashy yet vintage uh, look about the kit. Uh, that's what Breakbeats by Questlove is all about. Okay, so you're probably wondering why the bags are on the drums now. The purpose of this drum set is to be portable and also to have muted sound. So, that's our multi purpose breakbeat kits by Quest Love uh, mutable and portable. So and they're they're starting at three hundred and ninety nine bucks at Guitar Center. Now the first thing I noticed about this, first of all, is they look great. These that this kit looks fantastic. It looks like a legit kit, unlike the Rhythm Traveler. Now Pearl has a drum kit called the Rhythm Traveler, which I don't even know if they still make it anymore. But what the Rhythm Traveler was, was this nestable drum set with, uh, I believe it was a 20 or maybe an 18 by 6 kick. So it was really tiny. Very tiny. But it didn't, it didn't sound all, all that great. It sounded like crap, if I'm being honest. <laughs> it sounded horrible. But... The portability, and I, I, when when I started Visible, we bought five of them and put in the drum room. I used them for my teaching and everything. They were fantastic, but it was definitely not a kit you were going to gig with. Now I can see this as a kit you could gig with. I could absolutely see that. The floor tom, or the kick drum, is going to sound like a floor tom, a muted floor tom. The 13-inch the floor tom is going to sound like a 13-inch floor tom. Now, personally, I find 13 by 13 toms 
really difficult to tune. Maybe not as maybe not as hard as like thirteen by tens. Thirteen by tens are. God, I hate tuning thirteen by ten toms. There's just something about the math that makes those toms hard to tune. Maybe a thirteen by thirteen wouldn't be as bad. But the kit looks fantastic. It looks like a legit kit, and uh, I I could see this absolutely for like gigging jazz musicians. This makes me want to go out and kind of set up my Mapex Pro M, which has a little 18-inch kick and 8, 10, 14 uh, toms. It makes me want to uh, put those away or set them up in my in, a, in my studio here and go get one of these little kits and use this to to gig on. What's funny when you see pictures of this is the uh, if you have like a, a regular 20-inch ride cymbal, they look gigantic. They look absolutely huge. But I think I think this is really interesting. The price point, $399. The bags, which are, are mutes, they double as mutes, is fascinating. The Rhythm Travelers came with two sets of heads. Came with, you know, regular Mylar heads and a set of mesh heads that you could swap out. And the mesh heads felt and responded just like uh, like V-drum type heads, that kind of thing. That's exactly how they responded. But this is interesting. This is... I, I could see a small teaching studio needing and using one of these. I also like the fact that the snare drum is, you know, a legit snare drum. They look good. Having not seen one of these in person, I can't speak to the build quality. I think Ludwig's doing a lot of right things right now. And uh, knowing that, you know, Questlove is who he is and jumped the Yamaha ship and boarded the train of Ludwig, I think, is telling. Because he used Yamahas before he needed to get endorsed. And he had that Yamaha kit forever. It was an old, old Yamaha kit. So it's interesting, I, and and I think it further enhances uh, Questlove's prominence into American consciousness. You know, between his like shoes and his his hip hop clothing store, and, and being the the front man for the late night band, late night with Jimmy Fallon. Sidebar: Jimmy Fallon just got the gig. This was uh, as of like yesterday. Got the Tonight Show gig. He's going to take over the Tonight Show in spring of 2014. My question is, are the Roots going with him? I would think they'd have to. The Roots are ingrained into the fabric of that show. So how how could we have Late Night with Jimmy Fallon without the Roots? Now, they're not moving to L.A., though. J- Johnny Carson took the Tonight Show out to L.A. in 1972. But Jimmy Fallon's keeping it in New York. Fascinating. It's a good time to, to be a, a, a drumming fan, to have nightly access to one of the best drummers in the industry. And there he is every, every, every night, man, five, five nights a week, doing his thing. It's great. Love it. Another interesting thing we found and we put up on the pin board is, you know, it's always good. You know, we talk about, you know, kind of our idols, and we, we talk about the uh, drummers that have the most influence on us or, or uh, a large influence on us. You know, and we have kind of in mind what their world must be like on a daily basis. And, and it's probably, if you're like me, it's probably a little more glamour, glamorized in our mind, maybe romanticized, than it really is. Now, Steve Smith, the Steve Smith, has posted up video of him practicing drums at his own house. Take a listen. I'd like to let you know I'm having a great time using my Q3 to record and film my practicing. Here's some ideas I've been working on for the last few weeks.
cool about this is this drum kit's like set up right like in this kitchen, which I, I'm assuming is kind of like a, a, a side kitchen. So uh, that, that's, that's and let's, uh, you know, if you fast forward it, you know, he's on a, a different kit. And it's, it's like 10 minutes of watching Steve Smith practice. And it's not polished. You know, he, he messes some stuff up. It's just a, a camera. And it's picking up the, the, the camera is picking up the audio. And it's we're we're so used to seeing Steve Smith either in concert or in like really polished uh, video, like a Hudson type video or something, or seeing you know him in, in a clinic or something where there's lights and you know the the perfect kit and all that. So seeing these videos where he's just kind of doing his thing, like in in a house, it's really cool. It's, it's not slick. I, I thought it was fascinating. Speaking of fascinating, unearthed a couple of really some treasured videos that, that, that YouTube seems, seems to be really good at finding. All these old videos, which had no chance of ever getting like VHS or a DVD distribution. Some of them might. But these things that, 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 that are going to sit in the back of a library of, of a publishing house, it's finding new life on YouTube. Found three of them. First of all, one from Ginger Baker in a two-parter. And I'll play a little bit of it here. This is Ginger Baker, drum la lesson master. This is from Golden Ray Videos. And it's, it's Ginger I Baker. I got my first drum kit when I was 15. But I'd been playing the drums with knives and forks, spoons. In fact, I had a pair of drumsticks about a year before I had a drum kit. At school, whenever the teacher left the room, right, I'd start drumming on the desktop and the, all the kids would start dancing. I didn't discover, in fact, I was a drummer until I got invited to a party. And at the party, there was a band and all the kids kept coming up to me and saying, you've got to sit in, you must come on, Ginge, play the drums. And finally, they persuaded me. I sat down on the kit and I could play. <laughs> and I, uh, one of the, I think it was a trombone player or the trumpet player turned around to the, the guy next to him and said, Jesus Christ, we've got a drummer. You know, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, we did a uh, we talked about Ginger Baker, and I love this this old this old footage is awesome because there's Ginger Baker. You know, you hear the story of Ginger Baker stories, but it's on this like double bass giant Ludwig kit, and it's so awesome to see this stuff. Another amazing video I found was a drum clinic from Tony Williams, a Tony Williams drum clinic from 1985. So rare. We're going to pick it up right after he finished soloing. This was in three parts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see all of you here. Thank you. 
My name is Tony Williams, and I've been, uh, well, let's see. First, I'd like to thank Armin Zildjian, Lenny Demisio, and all the staff of Zildjian for inviting me to, to attend uh, such a pre prestigious gathering of audience and drummers. I feel really honored to be here. My first time in... Uh, Dallas, Texas. So thank you for inviting me. As you see, by the way I'm dressed, I'm performing surgery in the morning. Um, I was born in uh, 1945, and uh, at the age of two, my parents well, I was born in Chicago, let me say that, and at the age of two, my parents decided to move to Boston. And the fortunate thing about that was that they took me with them. So uh, that helped me a great deal. And in Boston, Boston being such an uh, educational capital of the world, you know that there are more institutions of learning in Boston than any other place on the planet. So. You grow up in Boston with a uh, kind of tradition of learning and education and trying to um, always learn something new. And in Boston, I had a great training with uh, a lot of drummers, uh, namely Alan Dawson. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. And uh, he was kind enough to help me a great deal. And uh, Alan, along with uh, two other drummers, one named, um, we called him Baggy, Baggy Grant. And, um, damn, I forgot his name. Damn, well, it's been so long <laughs> since I've done this. Anyway, there were three drummers in Boston. And Alan was a very uh, technically oriented drummer. He had all the technique in the world. And Baggy had no technique, but he could swing. He had a great feeling for the drums. And uh, the other drummer, I keep wanting to say Lenny Demusio, but <laughs> that's not his name. I'll think of it in a minute. But this third drummer, <laughs> that I can't remember his name, <laughs> he, uh, he epitomized creativity. So at an early age, I realized that watching these three drummers, that not one of those things alone would be the answer, but all three things. Having as much technique and um, expressive ability, and then secondly, having the um, feeling that goes along with it, and thirdly, your creativity to, uh, to express yourself. So, so that's what I've tried to combine. So what I, what I think is really fascinating about, about this is, you know, we have Tony Williams, who is Tony, played with Miles Day. I mean, Tony Williams. And he's given a clinic that looks just like, like anybody else's clinic, you know? He does his, you know, 20-minute solo at the beginning and comes out and talks and thanks sponsors and... And it's it's we, we get these guys who are our heroes and the, and the people. It's just like the Steve Smith video, you know. Here here's a guy who 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 we've we've dissected everything about their playing, and we know all of his records, and we know everything he has to say, and every everything he's about as a drummer. But seeing him in his natural element, and seeing like Tony Williams, who has become this such an influence on so many people, and seeing him given like a regular drum clinic, like you'd find at any basic. Goes, it goes to tell you that, that he's just a dude, man. He's just a dude. He's an amazing dude with amazing talent. But it's just it's just awesome to see and uh, having those rare videos. I mean, they're never they're never going to release a Tony Williams Drum Clinic from 1985 on DVD. But having Life Again on YouTube is awesome. One last one I want to talk about. Speaking of rare things to find on YouTube, you might have heard me talk about Portraits in Rhythm before by Anthony Tony Cerrone. 
And what this is, if you don't know what it is, if you have been through music school and percussion program, then you know what this red book of death looks like, and you know what's inside. But what it is, it's a, it's a series of drum etudes, and each etude is a portrait. Is a new etude that challenges whether it's meter or syncopation or subdivisions or, or so all these different things, and it, some of them are pretty easy technically that demands a lot of musical interpretation while others have a lot of the musical interpretation kind of written for you and the challenge is in the technical aspect and so here this is a, a, a an etude book which means so much to so many different people and being able to see the author talk about the book in some of the applications is Gold and is absolutely amazing. So here's a little bit. Hi, I'm Tony Sharon, and welcome to my introduction on my masterclass video series of Portraits in Rhythm. So what I'm doing here is giving an analysis of my interpretation of these etudes, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about my motivation in writing this book. So I was in my fifth year at the Juilliard School, and after studying five years of the great composers, and of course teaching percussion at that time, teaching snare drum students, I began to realize that all of what the great composers did when they put their music on paper, all of these elements were not in my, my snare drum books that I was using. Basically, it was either 2-4, 3-4, 4-4, four, 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 or 6-8 time. You never got into mixed meter. Um, there may have been a dynamic or two, but it would be a piano or a forte or maybe a fortissimo. Uh, there weren't many crescendos or diminuendos, and very rarely an accelerando or a retard. It was pure rhythm. We learned how to count pure rhythm. And here I am studying this music, and there are all these elements, plus fermatas and uh, you know uh, these musical directives. They kept telling us things in Italian and French and German to do to this music, and I realized why can I write some snare drum pieces that have these elements in it? And that was my motivation. And I also took some of the forms, ideas from the forms they use to write their music. So mine have short introductions, they have an A theme and a B theme, and then there may be some variations, and then a little coda at the end, just using what I had learned to put it in a book. So let me read a little bit from another book of mine on music. So that, that is Tony Cerrone, in his own words, talking about such a famous etude book. Fascinating. That's also was on the pin board. We'll have links to all of these and more over at the show notes. Click on the show for today, number 177. And if you're listening to this and we're coming to you from the past, then do a search for 177 for the show for today. And that is going to be all the news. The news was so long, it actually we actually ran out of drum background. So let's go ahead, while, while, while we're transitioning, let's go ahead and talk about today's topic, the DIY distribution. Do-it-yourself. Distribution, and let's let's talk about first about how it used to be. Well, before let me back up. Let me let me tell you why I think it's important to talk about. Because I think there are so many people out there, so many of you, so many listeners out there, who are in bands, or maybe they have uh, their marimba soloists, or maybe they maybe they write their own beats, or maybe their their own personal Skrillex or something. And you probably wonder, how can I get my music out there? How can I get my band's music out there? And that's why I think it's important to talk about, because times have changed, and it is absolutely possible for you to get your stuff out there, thanks to modern technology, computers, and one company that changed it all. The one company, well, no, not yet. First, let's talk about how it used to be. And this was, this was 
as a late, as as early as ten years ago. How it, how it used to be was you had a band or an artist that got good, that practiced every week in their in their garage or in their bedrooms or whatever, and got good and somehow cultivated a local following by playing gigs, by going playing shows out at this bar or this club or this festival or this fundraiser, most of them for free, most of them with a healthy mix of original material and some cover tunes. But you started, you got good, you got a local following, and then your next step was to somehow attract label interest. That was the goal to attract labels, so, so a record label to look at you. Now, this was either by luck, by networking, by knowing someone, or soliciting, uh, submitting a, an unsolicited demo to an A&R rep or something. Okay, now by luck, you know, let's talk about the success. By luck, which was somebody happened to be at a bar, heard your music, called up and said, we need to sign these guys. We need to do something with them. You know, that's the, uh, the Back to the Future end, you know, end of Back to the Future, Marvin Barry calling up his brother Chuck to tell him about the new sound. It's, it's that kind of thing. The likelihood of running into somebody is very low. However, if you do run into someone and they say you're amazing, then the likelihood of getting a recording deal out of it was high. The other thing was networking. Who do you know? Who can you get your music in front of? And this usually required some sort of demo or something. Some You found a way, whether it's uh, you and a... a tape recorder or a, a video recording or, or whatever and recorded yourself and put your demo out in front of people. Now, how you got that, you could either buy with networking, someone knows someone who passes your demo along, or submitting a non-solicited demo to a record company. Submitting a non-solicited demo, they will accept all the demos you can give them. However, you are going up against every other person who is doing the exact same thing. And when you get the picture in your head of a music executive sitting at their desk with a two-foot stack of CDs, that actually happens. And they pull out your demo, they stick it in their player, they listen to the first 30 seconds, and they know within 30 seconds whether or not they should keep listening. Not whether or not you get a deal, but whether or not they should even consider keeping listening. They know that within the first 30 seconds. Which is why your demo should be a demo and not a full-length record. Okay, so let's say somehow you got the attraction of a record label. Well, let's talk about why we even needed record labels. The reason we needed record labels was because the recording process was so expensive. And I'm talking about a commercial released recording. The gear was expensive, the manpower, the education, the people who knew how to run it, all of that was really expensive. Also, it was expensive to make records or CDs or cassettes. It was expensive to physically produce those items. That was expensive. It was expensive to get those things shipped and get those things out into stores. That was expensive. It was expensive for stores to keep your CDs on their shelf because they bought the stock. They took the chance on your record selling, and they also need their cut as well. You're picking up on a theme here? cost. It's all about money. And, and not that the industry, money, money, money. Obviously, it's an industry. It's a business. People are in business to make money. They're not all like greedy bastards. Pardon my French. Some of them are. <laughs> some, there are some snakes in the grass in any industry, and the music industry has their share. 
But you know, it's not like this evil record exec. Dun, 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 dun. It's not. No, it's not. It's not how it all is. But there's a lot of money to be spent. There's a lot of costs involved in one record, in making it, in recording it, in paying paying for its production, paying for its distribution. There's a lot of money at stake. And so what the record company did, and still does, I'm telling you how it used to be. This is this this process still exists. But there's a whole new side that has changed it and really shaken up the recording industry. So the label would front the cash for the recording. The label would say, I believe that you are talented enough that I am going to make a financial investment. And by say, when I say investment, you're talking about a loan, people. This isn't a record company just going, here's your money. Usually you get an advance and anybody who signed a record deal especially if you're like you're a small band and you're you're not if you're not already like selling out arenas most record deals were like this where the label would front all of the money to get the 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 record recorded produced uh, I mean like the production the physical production of a product uh, marketed and distributed the record label would front all that money and a large portion, if not all of that, was owed by the band. And the recording company, the record company, would hope that your band would sell enough units to at least break even. If you were lucky, your record made enough money to pay for the production and give the record company some money, some excess, some profit to be able to make another record. Now, once you made a record, your job was to go out, gig, and hopefully generate enough record sales to recoup the cost of producing and marketing the record. That was your job. This is exactly why whenever uh, a band makes a record, they go out on tour, is they are recouping the cost for that money. So these, these, these record deals aren't the big shiny things. They never really were. Now, most record deals protect the labels since the, the labels are the ones who are taking the most financial risk. Some of them do seem really unfair. But if you look at it from a business aspect, and I don't mean like an evil, cigar-smoking, giant, jerk type of a business arrangement, but they're putting a lot of cash into you. And so the recording, the the record deals exist to protect the label since they're at the most risk. And it really isn't until a band has a string of successful records, meaning they not only broke even, but they also made profit. But it's after that string of successes, it's after that is when the artist starts really seeing money. There's There's a rock band named Skillet. And it wasn't until their third or fourth record before they themselves as artists started kind of turning a corner. Because as soon as you start having three, four successful records, then your record deals become a lot less risky for the record company. There's a lot less risk involved. Because you've proven that that your record's not going to only be a good record, but it's also going to put butts in seats at concerts and sell units. And therefore, when you're going to work on your contract and work on your recording deal, you can make it a little less lopsided. Now, One Hit Wonders kind of break this mold because their single can have such meteor- uh, meteorologic, meteoric rise and it immediately generates a ton of sales because of one abnormal record or one abnormal single on a record. Don't believe me? Ask Blind Melon. That one song, Rain, was that No Rain? It was No Rain. Amazing song, loved it. And they, they had records and they had a following, but they're kind of known as a one-hit wonder because that one song was the one that really propelled them into the spotlight, but nothing else on any of their other records sounded like that one song, so they weren't able to really repeat the success of that one song. Or you have, you know, Hey Mickey, Come On Eileen, 
And we have these modern day one hit wonders as well. So the one hit wonders, they, they, they don't really fit this mold because their follow up efforts don't really, they're not as successful. But here is the beautiful thing it doesn't have to be this way anymore. And the reason is, is because one company came along, rewrote the rules of the music industry and left the recording industries looking like dinosaurs. This company was Apple, a computing company. A computer company came, saw the value, and we knew about the value ahead of time, but Apple was the first company to be able to really make digital distribution and online distribution of music made it viable, made it easy, made it relatively inexpensive and figured out a way through its computing in infrastructure, figured out a way to make it work for both artists and the label because they kind of sweetened the deal. They, they, had, they had this network of software that was ready to jump into it with the iTunes Music Store. And when the iTunes Music Store came along, and the record companies who were so, so entrenched into their own ways, they failed to re realize or to see the writing on the wall and allowed a computer company to come in, rewrite the rules, and leave them in the dark. It reminds me of like old locomotive industries. You know, are you, when, when, the, when things went from trains to automobiles, you know, are you going to be in the train business or are you going to be in the transportation business? Companies that were in the train business were left hurting. Companies that were in the transportation industry were able to dodge, parry, move with the times, and roll with it. I think about like Kodak. Kodak, you know, film and everything. The smartest thing Kodak ever did was change all the de art, their development centers and they started, what did you start seeing in Walgreens and other drugstores? Sure, you could go drop off your film. You could still do that. Believe it or not, you could still drop off your film at Kodak, at these little kiosks. But what they did was start installing printers very high quality printers. These aren't anything that you're going to walk into Best Buy and pull off the shelf, but they installed printers and allowed for printing technology at their stores and at their locations. So now consumers don't think of Kodak as, hey, they're the film people. They're old and, and dinosaurs. Now when they want photos printed, they can go and stick in their card, and Kodak still makes a profit. Kodak still exists. Kodak is still a brand in the national consciousness. Because they were able, because they realized they're not in the film-like business. They're in the picture business. And however pictures need to be delivered, they were able to move with it. What about Polaroid? Was Polaroid able to do this? Not so much. Now, if Polaroid had come, come along and figured out a way to make a digital printer or digital camera that can instantly print, then now we're talking. But they, they weren't able to, to make that switch. So iTunes came along and rewrote the book. Now, originally, iTunes was only limited to deals made with record companies. And so we didn't really have the ability to get our music out there. But that has all changed. And the, the company that really came across or came along first was a company that was already bucking the trend for CD distribution. And this was CD Baby at CDBaby.com. Now, they weren't the only. And they might have not even been the exact first, but I, I would say that they were one of the best known. And they came along. And they became really the first real independent distribution channel. 
And if you were if you were unfamiliar with CD Baby, how how it worked was you submitted your masters. No, mastering and production, that's a whole other thing. But you would submit your masters to CD Baby, and then you would give them your artwork files and everything else, and then they would create CDs for you. They were CD duplicating, but they were also a CD distribution. And so you could order your CD from CD Baby and sell them at your shows. Now, you get a steep discount, and you sell them at your shows for whatever cost. Kind of like Cafe Press. Kind of, but not quite so instant. And that's what CD Baby did. But what CD Baby was able to do was negotiate deals with industry, with iTunes and other kind of these industry interfaces. And CD Baby allowed you to get whatever you put onto CDs, whatever you got distributed through CD Baby. They negotiated so now those things can get into the iTunes music store. And that was huge because now me, Dave Croft, I can put my, my, a record together of whatever I want. It could be a stand-up comedy routine. It could be uh, my electronic music stuff. It could be a, a, a record of drum set solos. But using company like CD Baby, we'll talk about a bunch of other companies that do the same thing. Using those things, I could put my tunes right next to Michael Jackson, right? Now, the downside is, so can everyone else on the planet. So, yes, we can all get our music onto the iTunes Music Store, but you are now competing with everyone else who can do that. Record companies still control a large portion of iTunes. I'm not going to have the resources and the cash to be able to make a marketing push the way that record companies can. I can't, I would have to pay a lot of cash to get my record featured on the front of iTunes. So when you launch up iTunes, new this week, Dave Croft's drum set solos. That's not going to happen. I don't necessarily want it to happen. If it happened, I, I wouldn't cry. But. Justin Timberlake's new record, which is amazing, by the way. Great record. Oh, my gosh. We'll listen to a little bit of it later on the outro. But record companies still have that kind of clout because there is still the machine behind the scenes. But you're not in that machine. Maybe you want to be in the machine. Maybe your goal is to do the independent distribution thing to allow yourself to get into the scene or get into that machine, rather. Now, I'm going to talk about four or five, one, two, three, four. I'm going to talk about five different independent distribution channels. Now, this isn't recording. This is assuming that you have made your own recording. Luckily, recording's gotten tons cheaper now because it doesn't take $20,000 worth of gear to record anymore. Now, everything is on the computer. It's all in the digital audio workstation on the DAW. So recording is easier and cheaper. For the better or worse, there it is. So this conversation is assuming that you already have a product. Your band already has something recorded that you want to get out there. Maybe it's a demo. Maybe it's an EP. See, EP is the new buzzword for demo. We call them EPs, which are short for extended play, whereas you have like long play. So extended plays, but they're either like four or five song EP. It's kind of a demo or an early release. But so we're recording. You are. We're assuming rather you already have a recording. Let's talk about some different and. In- Indie distribution channels, some independent DIY distribution channels, some ways to get your music into some really popular venues. iTunes Music Store, a huge one. We want to get into iTunes Music Store. The second one, Amazon MP3. Believe it or not, if ever if I'm ever buying a record, now I'm not an audiophile, I don't know, uh, I'm compressed. That's for a different show and a different host. 
but I buy my stuff through Amazon MP3. The flexibility it gives me, their MP3s, their high, their high bit rate. Like I said, I'm not an audiophile, so the compression doesn't bother me. Uh, iTunes is a little too closed for my taste. Now, I love iTunes for podcasting. This podcast would not be what it was if it weren't for iTunes. Believe me, we were there before iTunes embraced podcasting in 2006, I think, is when uh, iTunes started allowing podcasts, and that blew up. And podcast would not be what it was if it weren't for iTunes integration of podcasts. But for music sales, it's a little too insular, and I don't like it. I love Amazon MP3. Now, there are other two emergent broadcast level avenues that we're looking to get into. Now, these aren't the only ones. These are just the four. The, the two sell, the, the, the retail, would be iTunes and Amazon MP3. I know there are more. There's Napster and all that. I know. But the two streaming services, which you got to think more like radio, are Pandora and Spotify. And how those work is, is iTunes and Amazon, somebody buys your record, Apple or Amazon takes a cut of that, and whatever's left pays you. And how you pay out, that's, that's up to you. That's, that's between you and your bands and, and however that money is made. Okay, there's that. The way Pandora and Spotify work is they pay out because they make they, they pay a broad licensing agreement with these distribution companies and they pay out something a little bit to the artists. And for like Spotify, artists get uh, I believe it's 16 cents or 15 cents per every 100 plays, which doesn't sound like a lot. But you have to think larger. You have to think, I'm not just getting 100 plays. I'm getting 1,000 plays, or I'm getting 100,000 plays. And the math starts making a little bit more sense. And, pa and Pandora works very similar. For X number of plays, you get a cut of that. And of course... The production company gets it. If it's a record label, it gets a cut of that. So that's what we're trying to get into. Now, when we talk about Pandora and Spotify, we're also looking at ways that we need to collect performing rights licensing royalties. Not licensing, but royalty. That We need to talk about royalties. And I'm going to cover that. That's like ASCAP, and BMI, and CSAC. That's coming up a little bit later. But we're going to have to think about those. Because these, Pandora, Spotify, these are much more like broadcasting or radio. As opposed to album sales. See? See how they're, they're, they're still distribution avenues. There's retail, and then there's kind of broadcast. So let's think of it in two different ways. But luckily, these services, the first two especially, get us there. So we're going to talk about CD Baby and TuneCore. These are, are there to help you get your tunes distributed through these different avenues. Several avenues, but mainly iTunes, Amazon MP3, Spotify, and Pandora. We're also going to look at Reverb Nation. We're going to look at Bandcamp. And we're even going to talk about SoundCloud. Let's talk about CD Baby and TuneCore. Because if you're like me, you've probably looked at both of them and think, hey, when, what's, first of all, what's the difference between the two? And, and second of all, what's the cost CD Baby, like I said, started out as a CD duplication and shipping service and ex has expanded and was one of the first to expand into digital distribution into iTunes and Amazon MP3. Now, how they work is, is you pay a one-time fee either per song or per single. And it's $49 per album or $12.95 per single. So 50 bucks a song or an album or 13 bucks a single. So if you have one song you want to put out, 13 bucks. If 
you have a whole album, it's 50 bucks. And this includes CD and download sales on cdbaby.com and worldwide digital and physical distribution. So that's cool. Now they also have a pro level which includes registration and royalty collection. Now if you're a member of a performing rights organization, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, then that's going to be $100 per album. And what they do, or let me, and, or $40 per single. And what this does is now, instead of you tracking your sales, now CD Baby tracks your sales, reports them to your PRO, Performing Rights Organization. They take their little cut off of it, and then the PRO cuts you a check every quarter for how many sales you made. Now, the single song has no physical sales. You know, it's not a single. They also have disc manufacturing costs and everything. And you can buy download cards. But what's really important with CD Baby is a one-time fee. You pay once. As opposed to Tune, uh, TuneCore, which is TuneCore.com. We're going to have all these links in our show notes. TuneCore is purely digital distribution. They do not do any physical product, unlike CD Baby. To be honest, CDs are out. I heard a report that said by 2016, record companies will not be distributing CDs by 2016. That there's already a plan in place to phase out compact discs. In 2016, we will have more vinyls being produced than compact discs. And that's just where it's going. It's going to digital, and it's going to the cloud. And for the purest, there will be vinyl. Now, you might think purely digital distribution, surely there is less cost. Here's the caveat with TuneCore. There is less upfront cost, but they also have yearly fees. So for an album, you pay 30 bucks the first year, and they say an album is two or more songs. Then every year to keep that album distributed, you pay 50 bucks. And you get you get you you keep all your rights for all of this, but you get, check it out, you get a hundred percent of the sales. Whereas CD Baby takes a cut. CD Baby keeps 9% of the net income. Or if you're making CDs, they keep $4 per unit sold. So they charge you $14 or $4, and you can ask for $13, and you will net $9. So if you, if you get CD Baby to make CDs, they charge you $4 per CD, and then you can buy you can buy 100 CDs from CD Baby for $4. You can go and sell them for however many. Or you can order them directly through CD Baby. Now remember, CD Baby is a one-time fee. So there's no more fees, but they're going to take a 9% cut. Whereas TuneCore, you keep 100% of the sales, but you have to pay every year to keep that distributed. What works better for you? That's up to you and your budget. That's up to you and your budget. So album, 30 bucks, or fi- and 50 bucks for each following year. A single is only $10 and then $10 each following year. That's one song, but you keep all your rights, us- upload custom cover art, and you keep 100% of your sales. Now here's what's interesting. You know how CD Baby had, uh, they had a pro-level registration the pro album sign-up, which was $100, what TuneCore does is you pay a one-time $75 setup fee to to set up your publishing administration, and they collect the royalties all over the world, all the different performing rights organizations all over the world, and they keep 10% of the royalties that they collect for you. 
which is pretty standard, 10 to 15% as far as management and stuff. That's, otherwise, you're, you're the one having to like report your sales and all, on all that stuff. These are publishing royalties. This is licensing. This, is, this isn't someone bought your album and you, and you get a performance. This is your song was played on Spotify or your song was played on Pandora. This is, this is for that. This isn't the sales. This is getting, collecting your royalties from those, those channels. And you get quarterly statements. So you pay your 75 bucks. They keep one time. They keep 10%. And then you can register as many songs for free. You can even register non tune core distributed songs at no extra cost. Which of these two is better? That's up to you. Personally, because I have no interest in CD Baby, TuneCore is more attractive. I love the fact that I keep 100% of the sales. This is not including the cut. I, I should hold off before I say that. Because there's more there. Because iTunes is going to take a cut. What this means is iTunes takes their cut but TuneCore doesn't take another cut. Whereas CD Baby, iTunes takes their cut, CD Baby takes their cut, and then you're left with however much. And I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have that information at, at this time as far as how much iTunes takes. Maybe, maybe our listener knows how much iTunes takes. I'm not sure. But I like the fact that there's not another hand in the pot. I'd rather pay my 30 bucks and be done with it for a year and I keep 100% of my sales. Then at the end of the year, I can say, hey, is it worth, is it, am I going to make more than $50 in sales over the next year to keep this distributed out there? I like the fact that it's lower up front. I keep 100 and by the way, this distributor taking a cut, the, the iTunes take, this is all normal business. Because everybody that has, everybody that is putting money into releasing your record needs to recoup that money at some point. Everybody, the distributor, the marketer, everybody, everybody who's taking a chance, everybody who's taking a risk on you being good and selling units and selling at gigs, everyone needs to recoup their costs. So between the two, man, that's up to you. Personally, I like TuneCore a little bit better. That's just me. Admittedly, from like my electronic music type of distribution, I'm actually thinking about it. I'm thinking about putting uh, a, a record out there of some of my electronic tunes. But it's purely digital, and I think that's where it's going. I, I would love to know the numbers from CD Baby. How many... How many Records of CD babies actually get CDs pressed. If I went to a concert, I would much rather buy a little download card for five bucks and then go download it as opposed to paying for a $13 CD that I'm going to stick into my laptop, rip it, and then put it in a box. Am I the only one there, guys? Listeners, are you, are you sitting in your car feeding CDs into a changer or do you have an iPod? plugged into it or your phone. You know what? I, I get to where I've subscribed to Spotify and I listen to Spotify in the car because it will, it will stream over 3G and stream really, really, really well. That's, a, that's, that's been my... Why, why it took me so long to jump on the Spotify bandwagon, I'll never know. But I am a converted believer. And I pay my 10 bucks a month and it's absolutely worth it absolutely worth it for me the consumer i think it's a great time to be a music consumer it's fantastic so cd baby and tune core those are going to be the two primary ways to get your stuff <laughs> into amazon mp3 itunes spotify pandora now, there are a couple of other ways. They're not the only ways. Those are just two primary ways and the biggest ways, I would say. Let's talk a little bit about Reverb Nation. Reverb Nation has been coming along for quite a while, 
And it started out really as, as a, an artist portal, an artist landing page. That was really how Reverb Nation started. And it's grown much, much beyond that because now as a Reverb Nation member where you, you, you set up your, your site and you put your photos and all this stuff and it's really become an artist portal. There are some bands where you go to theirbandname.com and it just points you to their Reverb Nation. I've absolutely seen it. Or to their Bandcamp page. And we'll talk about Bandcamp in a second. Now, Reverb Nation has tiered pricing, just like some of the other pricing that we've seen. They have a basic plan, which includes a free Android fan app, free email template. You can, you can sign up and have 500 fans. You can upload unlimited songs, but they have to be 8 megabytes. Upload, uh, or anybody can download your songs, gig finders, Facebook app, and all this stuff. And that's free. What it's not is digital distribution. It is not that. This is, we're a band and we're wanting to get exposure and we're going for a grassroots building our brand. Reverb Nation's great for that. Putting your stuff out there, letting people hear it. But as far as getting distributed, that's the free version. Remember, everybody needs to recoup their cost, even Reverb Nation. What Reverb Nation is, instead of paying 30 bucks for an album or... Um, or whatever, they have a monthly fee. It's 20 bucks a month. And so for 20 bucks a month, you get all the stuff that the free, but you also get a mobile app for iPhone and Android. So you get like your own band's app. With, I mean, you, you can push all this fan stuff and everything. I'm sorry, the custom phone app is only on the Macs. I'll get to that in a second. You can get a Reverb Nation pressed kit and you get your digital distribution into iTunes, Spotify, MP3. They say in 40 more. Like Google Music, eMusic. And you get, the, the plan gets two distribution credits allowed each year. So you can release two new albums every year. Now, it doesn't look like singles. It looks just like two things. So obviously, you would want to, to release a whole record as opposed to a single. But because you're paying 20 bucks a month, you get 100% of your royalties. Of your royalties. Not what I, remember, iTunes is going to take a, a little cut as well. But... Reverb Nation isn't going to take another cut because they're getting paid because you're paying monthly. That's how they get paid. So let's say you can't swing 10 bucks or you can't swing 30 bucks for a year and then 50 bucks the following year, but you can maybe pay 20 bucks a month. Now, if you sign up for a year, you get a two month trial and all that. And there's other things like email templates and widgets. Upload your the maximum upload size is increased. Well, they also have a forty-one dollars and sixty-seven cents a month that is billed annually. It's called their Max Plan, and this is the same digital distribution, but you get four releases a month, and you get the custom iPhone app, unlimited song uploads, a hundred thousand fans, fifty plus email templates. So yeah. Now let's say you don't want to subscribe. They have other digital distribution plans that start at 35 bucks. I don't want to get into that. But what what Reverb Nation offers that TuneCorn CD baby don't is a really well developed artist landing page kind of thing. That's that's what they're doing. That's that's their angle. Now let's talk about Bandcamp. This is bandcamp.com. And what Bandcamp is, is think more like a vendor portal that allows you to sell your music 
yourself either through their site or their own their own site. This is a little bit like CD Baby, where you put your stuff on their site and then you drive people to Bandcamp to buy your site. They take a cut and then you get what's rest. It's free to register, but they take a cut out of everything that they sell. 15%, they take a 15% cut, whatever you choose. This is very much like Cafe Press and 10% on merch. They do have some premium upgrades like download codes and download credits. And there's a volume discount and blah, blah, blah. But that's Bandcamp. Bandcamp was kind of before Reverb Nation and was very similar to it. But I feel like Reverb Nation has kind of come by and passed them. That's just, that's just my take. Now, I don't believe that Bandcamp gets you into iTunes and gets you into all of those things. What they do is they're an alternative to that. This is, uh, this is wanting to be the distrib distribution point for you. This is wanting to be the iTunes for you so that you can plug in your own little Bandcamp thing, your own little Bandcamp widget onto your website, and people buy through Bandcamp, and then they, you don't have iTunes taking a cut and CD Baby taking a cut. Now you have... Bandcamp taking their 15% and then you are left. So if you sell a $10 record, they take $1.50 and you net $8.50. Whereas if you sell a $10 record on iTunes, CD Baby is going to take their 90 cents. iTunes is going to take their undisclosed amount. And then you're left with the balance of that. But Bandcamp isn't getting you into those things. It's not getting you into Spotify. It's not getting you into all those things. Because that costs money to do. And Bandcamp's not going to do it. So if you're looking for an alternative to that, maybe a little bit more grassroots, I want more control over it, or I want to potentially make more money, then Bandcamp would be the way to go. The last distribution aspect I wanted to talk about is SoundCloud. I love SoundCloud. SoundCloud, they, their goal is to be the Twitter for independent music creation. I love SoundCloud. My SoundCloud is Davy K, D A V Y K. Go like me or follow me. Fun, good times. It's where I put all my uh, electronic music stuff out there and uh, all the all the tracks I make for my my <laughs> I'm drawing a blank a virtual class stuff for full sale. That's that's over my SoundCloud. SoundCloud is absolutely great place for exposure. It's a way that, that you, and, and they have their own app as well, it's a way that you can put your things out there. People can follow you. They could follow you as an artist, and then every time you make a post, it shows up in their little SoundCloud feed, a la Twitter. And they have widgets that you can plug into Facebook or into your website and everything. If you want to see SoundCloud widgets at work, go to 818studios.com. The number is 818studios.com. And you'll see all those little playlists. That's all. That's all SoundCloud. Little SoundCloud widgets. Now, they don't themselves have avenues for buying records, but they do have, they, they call them apps, SoundCloud apps, where you can plug in your CD Baby or other avenues of distribution and people can buy those tracks on SoundCloud through CD Baby. Now, how much can you upload? Well, that limits. They, they limit the number of hours of content that you can upload based on their tiered pricing. They have a free package. It's very generous. I think it's like two hours or maybe one hour. Or you can upgrade to the next tier and then have even more, more hours. I absolutely love it. Um, love SoundCloud. Now let's talk about performing rights organizations. I mentioned them before. PROs exist to collect royalties from performance, airplay, and or licensing. Royalties. 
the way it works is like radio stations or even restaurants or, 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 or whatever, they pay a fee to ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. They pay a fee to those organizations. And then every time they play a record, they report to that organization that, hey, we played this song, and then the organization pays their artists. Radio station plays blanket fee, reports the tracks they're playing. The PRO then takes those royalties from the fee and then pays out to the artists. So radio stations don't have to pay for every song they play. They, play, they pay a blanket license. That allows them to play any ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. Now I know this... We're going to hear from, let me find it here. i got one video I want to play. And this is uh, Todd Brabeck, the Vice President and Director of Membership for ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And he's talking about the difference between ASCAP and BMI. Check it out. The primary one to ask you up is, well, as I said, it's a writer and publisher uh, owned organization. It was founded by writers and publishers really to enforce the copyright law, uh, you know, to collect money for performances of writers' works. In those clubs, it was really just live performances in those days. It was founded in 1914. Uh, BMI was founded in 1939. It's a corporation uh, owned by the broadcasting industry. And... Uh, so there's a big difference right there between the both organizations uh, because you know the broadcasters are are our are, are biggest licensee and uh, uh, in the case of BMI I mean they actually own their own organization so but writers as I said they join either organization you can't be a member of both you can have to, if you're if you join ASCAP you can't affiliate with BMI uh, I can if you're affiliated with BMI uh, you can't uh, join ASCAP I mean we all have contracts so you're in, uh, if you're a member of ASCAP or affiliate of BMI, you're with that organization through the term of the contract. And then after you can terminate the contracts, there are various ways to terminate them, And because if, if you want to leave and go from one to the other. But if you do, uh, then you would you know, leave, and then you would either leave your works behind with the old organization, and all new works would be with the new organization. So you could have, which does happen, uh, you know, not infrequently, you know, a writer actually getting checks from ASCAP and also getting checks from BMI because they may have been a member of one at some time in their life and have performances still. So, but at, the, at any one given point in time, you can only be a member of one organization. It's a complex field because if you go through the uh, uh, payment formulas for both ASCAP and BMI, I mean, there are uh, different types of uh, performances. Let's say on tele television, you've got underscore, you've got theme songs, you've got visual vocals, you've got jingles, promos. Uh, copyright uh, copyright arrangements of public domain works. All those things are paid differently. They have different payments attached to them. Both organizations have different payment rules for television, for radio, for every type of uh, medium. Then the specific genres that are performed in that medium, I mean, uh, that really doesn't it's really the medium that determines the how things are paid. So you really have to go through both organizations payment rules. You've got to know how the rules are changed so you don't go into one place and all of a sudden a month later they change the rules on you and you're stuck for two years. So you've got to understand how they pay uh, and also how they change their payment rules. And, and it all, you know, start, the starting point is the amount of money that comes into the organization and the philosophy of how they split that money up. The foreign area is a very big area. I mean, we collect, I think, over well over $200 million just for foreign performances of writers' works. And so you need good relationships as a PR performing rights organization here in the United States with the foreign society. So if your own organization doesn't have great relationships or they don't go in and audit the foreign societies, uh, they're called tech, technical business, they're friendly audits actually in quotes. But just to make sure where you're getting your fair share of monies. Uh, so there are a lot of things that you have to know about your own organization here in the United States for you to make the right decision because your decision, your uh, I won't use the words you're stuck with, but as long as you're a member of some place, under uh, unless you terminate that contract, all of your works are licensed by that particular organization and are paid by that particular organization. First of all, if you can meet the pe some people at the organizations, I think it's always good to have some kind of a contact there. Uh, we've got offices in uh, New York, Nashville, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, Miami, 
um, Atlanta, London. We, we have an office there. Even though London is not a member, it's not for people signing. It's for just to make sure that a foreign writer goes through ASCAP in the United States because the writers, the foreign writers, have a choice to go through ASCAP or BMI here in the states. But uh, I think it's good to meet the people, know something about the philosophy of the organization, uh, what, how, why they were founded is very important. Uh, the reasons, because they're very different from ASCAP and BMI. The payment schedules are, are important to uh, look at. You've got to understand how each organization is paying you. You've got to make sure that the monies that are being collected from a particular area uh, are paid only to writers and publishers who have performances in that area. That may sound obvious, but uh, you know, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, uh, and it's just really uh, the contracts are important. You've got to understand the contracts, what they mean, the duration of the contract. Uh, I know with ASCAP, they're one-year contracts. BMI, they're two-year writer, five-year publisher. So, you know, there are differences in both organizations, uh, and uh, I've just given you some of the basic ones on it. But the uh, philosophy of, uh, of payment, the founding, the reason for founding, the uh, fairness and equality of treatment amongst writers and publishers is very important. And so th that is that was Todd Brabeck, the Vice President and Director of Membership for ASCAP. And so you might be wondering, wow, this is, sounds really, really pretty intense all of a sudden. And as soon as we start getting into Pandora and Spotify, then this PRO starts to kind of make a difference. Now, it's important to know that ASCAP and BMI are both nonprofit, meaning that, that, that they are governed by the rules of nonprofit organizations as far as how much that they can make and all of that. And they're a little bit different. Uh, ASCAP stands for the American Association of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. I hope I said that right. The American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And it historically has been more for composers and songwriters. Seems obvious, but BMI stands uh, Broadcast Music Incorporated, also nonprofit, and historically has been for those in the entertainment and broadcast industries. The way it works and, and how you become members is with ASCAP, you, there's open enrollment once you have a qualified performance. And they have a long list of qualified performances. I'm an ASCAP member because my qualified performance was I had one of my pieces performed at a university. I had one of my jazz pieces performed at the University of Memphis, and that then qualified me to become an ASCAP member. Now, BMI... You submit for affiliation, and then there's a process for that. Now, there's another, there's a third called CSAC, which at one point stood for the Society of European Stage Authors and Composers. It's the smallest of the three PROs in the U.S., founded in 1930. It's actually the second oldest in the U.S., and originally, historically, was for more for country and the Christian music industry, the country music industry. But it's really growing. Now, it is a for-profit organization, and they retain a portion of the collected royalties. Why, why would you even think about doing this? Well, they are much more selective of who they accept. You submit, and you submit your works, you submit why you think you need to be a member of this royalty organization, and then they might choose you as a, an affiliate. Now, the flip side is, is that they actually work to get their artists exposure. They have a team of people, writer and publisher reps, who exist to help their artists get more exposure. So that's, that's the flip side. They, they, CSAC hustles a little bit more for their members than I would say ASCAP or BMI does. CSAC seems to be really growing, and I think it's the fastest growing, because it's, it's, it's a little, it kind of turns it on its ear a little bit, the performing rights organization. Now it's import, important to realize that PROs are for songwriters, not performers. 
And we're talking about the person who composes the song. And if you're in a band, then uh, who, who is that? Is it the, the person who came up with the melody and the lyrics? Is it all three? And you need to worry about, not worry about this, you need to work this out. Really soon, as soon as you start talking about distribution, you need to figure out, there's, there's Buddy in the background. <laughs> Buddy's feeding time for Buddy. That's, that's what you're hearing in the background, guys. But you need to figure this, you need to figure it out of who's getting songwriting credit. Because they're the ones who are going to get the royalties for as long as the song is in rotation. As long as the song is being distributed and being licensed, whether by Pandora, Spotify, Radio Station, Muzak, whatever. Whoever wrote the song, whoever's getting songwriting credit is the one who's going to get. Now, if you're the drummer on a recording, like if I go and lay down drums for a Christina Aguilera record, I am, I'll, I'll get paid for hire, but I won't get royalties on that. And depending on who got songwriting credit, Christina Aguilera, she'll get some 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 royalties from the record itself, but she's not going to get any songwriting royalties from it. She might get other royalties that are negotiated in her contract, but she's not going to be getting ASCAP royalties. Does that make sense? She's not going to be getting BMI royalties. These are for music creators, not music performers. Many times, they're, they're one and the same. Sometimes they're not. They might get other other royalties from airplay and everything, but they're not going to get the songwriting royalties. So as an artist or as a songwriter, you would join one. Now, if you're a music publisher, you would join all of them because you might be publishing an artist or a songwriting that is a member of BMI. You might be publishing a songwriter, which is an ASCAP songwriter or CSAC. And so a publisher is join all, but as an artist, as a songwriting, as a songwriter, you would join one. And it's up to you. I have joined ASCAP. CSAC looks really, really appealing. It's, like I said, it's the fastest growing, I believe. But I've joined ASCAP. I like the history behind ASCAP. Um, and ASCAP was kind of, they were the first, they were the ones who've been doing it the longest. And I get like weekly, sometimes three or four times a week, little newsletters. And so there's all kinds of benefits and like discounts and all this kind of stuff that also goes along with it. We're going to have links to these places in our show notes, as well as an amazing article on how all this works from, ironically, howstuffworks.com. There's a, there's a, there's a page that they have set up about music royalties. It's like eight pages long. It's really, really great. And uh, I would encourage you to check that out um, when you get a chance. So there it is, how to get your stuff out there, how to get your music distributed. There's so much more opportunity now than there was 10 years ago. CD Baby, TuneCore, Reverb Nation, Bandcamp, these are all ways that you can get your music into the hands of your listeners or into the ears or into the hands, into their iPod, which is they're holding, I guess. And it's so much better now for the independent artists. Just know that you are vying for the listener space of everybody else who's also doing it because it's so easy, which kind of brings up a caveat. You know, it used to be that if you had talent, you were told you should distribute it. You should get a record deal. But now technology has made it so easy that anyone can distribute it that some people might not sit and think about whether they should or not. They just think they should because they can. It's kind of like citing your source in a paper. You, the reason that you can only cite a book or, a, or a, a bona fide source is because there's a vetting process of whether a book publisher inks a deal for a book deal. With the internet, that vetting process, there's no industry vetting process, so who is the vetting process? You know who the vetting process is? You. You are the new vetting process. You are who's deciding who gets your ears, who gets your money, 
You know, we didn't talk about YouTube. That's more like in promotion and everything. But here's what's interesting. Billboard's Hot 100 list have started to include YouTube hits. That's industry shattering. That's huge. That's big news. And so with that, the Harlem Shake was topping the Billboard Hot 100. But YouTube is definitely a viable exposure. It would be right along the same lines of SoundCloud. So we see a lot of things. What we have in the background, we have from the new Justin Timberlake record, Blue Ocean Floor. Amazing. Such a gorgeous song. And Justin Timberlake's going to get a few pennies from me playing this on my Spotify. This is Spotify. I love Spotify. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate you sticking around. These, uh, man, these season eight shows have been super long. I hope it's okay. I hope you're all good. Remember, you can like us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash drummer talk or follow us on Twitter at drummer talk. Also remember, please help support Drummer Talk by making a donation. Remember that 100% of the proceeds go directly back into the show, back into web hosting and everything else. Thank you so much for those that have already downloaded. It's a huge blessing. I'm humbled. But we could always use more. Always use more. And again, 100% of those proceeds go back. So if you like the show, think about sending a couple of bucks. You can make a donation. Any amount helps. How about a shout out on iTunes? Like what we're doing? Want to help other people find us? Well, how that happens and how you get featured in iTunes and how you get pushed up to, like in the podcast list, good reviews. Would love for you to take a few moments. Give us a shout out on iTunes. Go uh, give us a four-star review, five-star reviews. Do you have a topic suggestion or a question for the show? You can let us know at drummertalk.org slash contact. We would love to have your questions. Now here's what I think I want to do next week. You know, I got talking earlier about the hit like a girl. And I think Mrs. What is Up would have something to say on this topic. So next week, I want to hear the women's perspective in music. And I'll see, I'll try to li uh, line up Jay Frizz and see if I can't get her to talk with us. Maybe do a little interview with her. But yeah, I would love to hear the women's perspective in music. Is it the boys' club it once was? Have we progressed as a society past the testosterone expectation of the music industry? Are you a, a female trying to make it in the... Maybe you're a recording engineer. Maybe you're a, a show production light rigger. Maybe you're a drummer. Maybe you're a guitarist. Maybe you don't play flute in the band. So we're going to have Mrs. What is Up sit with us to give us and help us understand the women's perspective in music. So be sure to tune in next week for German Talk number 178. I have been your host, Dave Croft. Thank you so much for joining in. German Talk is copyright 2013, 818 Studios. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. Music played on the podcast remains copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. Once again, be sure to hit the show notes at drummertalk.org. Click on the show for 177. Until next time, peace. Just send your heartbeat out.